Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. Today we're very pleased to be hosting Dr. Sean Hayes of NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Centre. After growing up on a sheep farm in upstate New York, Sean received undergraduate degrees from the State University of New York, Cobbleskill and Cornell, and his PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he studied marine mammal communication, physiology, and reproductive behavior in large cetaceans and pinnipeds. Sean began working for the National Marine Fisheries Service on Hawaiian monk seals in 2001 and then transitioned to salmon and the Southwest Fisheries Science Center Santa Cruz Lab in 2002 where he developed the Scott Creek Research Program on steelhead and coho salmon. In 2009, Sean assumed the leads for the National Marine Fisheries Service Salmon Ocean Survey for so Southern Oregon and California and Central Valley Juvenile Chinook Acoustic Telemetry Migration Survival and Predator Prey Studies. Sean participated in NOAA's Leadership Competencies Development Program between uh, 2014 and 2016. In May 2016, Sean became the Protected Species Branch Chief at NOAA's um, and, uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where he's supervising the teams managing their Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act based research portfolio including salmon, marine mammal, and sea turtle research programs. After the presentation, we'll open the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Sean. Thank you, Darla, and thanks everyone for um, dialing in today. I'm going to be talking about uh, a large research program that was really the the uh, huge team effort in California and conducted and organized and performed by a, a cast of characters, which I'll acknowledge at the end, but I don't want to um, give the impression that um, in any way am I solely responsible for any of this. In many respects, I'm almost completely uninvolved, particularly since I've moved to the East Coast now and I'm presenting work that's continued on without me, and it was more from the perspective of my new involvement with Atlantic Salmon that I thought this might be of value to the listeners. We're going to be talking about um, evaluating the impacts of bass predation on salmon and more specifically the methodologies that we de designed to answer this, address that question um, from a management for managers on the west coast and I sort of cheekily called it a how-to guide of proving bass eat salmon. A tiny bit of background in California. Um, California is a pretty massive state with massive economic enterprises. It's the eighth largest economy, or I guess now seventh largest economy on the planet, which includes you know homes of the tech industry as well as massive agricultural industries. All of this is supported by a water infrastructure that's been, we've essentially modified most of the river, major river systems in California to support water infrastructure such that we can move water via the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers and aqueducts and canals from Northern California all the way to Southern California. This impact on the rivers, of course, has a question of how do salmon survive and manage in that, particularly when in 65 million acres of historically anadromous fish habitat, only 15% of that remain unchanged. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, challenges for salmon in California in those situations, and and really it, it comes down to a, a challenge of what I've, I've written recently sort of describing as a challenge to prove the bloody obvious because the quest, the stakeholder costs at the other end of the question in, in conflict with salmon conservation are so huge. So this includes a, a fishery that, depending on how you look at it, is you know, $250 million, including all the sort of extrapolated economic benefits of towards restaurants and everything else. Um, food and lively, safetyhood and lively for 500 million people, or for, sorry, 500,000 people living in the California Delta region where there's flood control issues roughly $40 billion worth of agriculture, which is, depending on how you look at it, 13 to 45% of the U.S. agricultural system, freshwater supplies for 25 million people, and, and all, all the stakeholders that are involved with that historically would blame the ocean for salmon's challenges in terms of why it wasn't doing well in California. 
in any solution to sort of manage salmon recovery and water infrastructure requires approval by the National Marine Fisheries Service. So obviously there was sort of a lot at stake about doing things as simple as proving salmon need water or salmon, you know, might be impacted by bass problems. And so we essentially needed more data and more science to support some conclusions to inform managers on how to go forward with salmon and humans coexisting in California. This included a series of empirical studies where our first challenge was to just determine whether or not the fish are dying in the river to get at this overlying ambi underlying ambiguity of do they just die in the ocean or is fresh are freshwater management practices responsible for fish survival. If they are dying in the river, then that moves the science to a next level question of, if so, where, when, and why are they dying? This work started um, before I really assumed um, a, a leadership role in our, our Central Valley field operations and, and was led um, in many respects by Cyril Michel, who's on the call with me today as part of his graduate thesis work at UC Santa Cruz, um, looking at late fall Chinook movement and survival from the upper Sacramento River um, near a, ha a hatchery release dock all the way to the Golden Gate where they were navigating roughly 500 kilometers and this work was what you're seeing here in this graph is a, a cumulative survival plot so the y-axis is cumulative survival with the idea is that at the top of the top northernmost point of the Sacramento the 100 percent of them were still alive and then upon release what percentage of them of these acoustically tagged fish with Vemco tags were still alive when they reached the Golden Gate. And what we saw is that in most or many years, we were lucky if 3% of the hatchery release fish actually survived to reach the ocean entry point um, to the Pacific Ocean. And in one particular year out of the five years of study, we actually had 16% of the fish reach the ocean entry point. Um, what correlated with this was a factor of four of the driest years on record in California and one of the wetter years on record. And so this came to sort of a, a conclusion that maybe water is actually important in salmon downstream migration survival. Again, perhaps a bloody obvious answer to many of the things, but please remember the everything that we were seeking to use water for as an alternative need. So the challenge, the life history strategy that we discovered here was for juvenile salmon, their hatchery fish was to just simply swim fast and get out of what was effectively a broken river system. And that we discovered most of this mortality that occurred happened within a short time period of just two to three weeks post release from the hatchery. The net realization here is that in a wet year, you have a you know a, an order of magnitude more fish make it to the ocean than you do in a dry year, um, which then sort of determines it leaves things up to the ocean at that point. But it has drastic re implications for overall river and survival. So our first task in this challenge was you know addressing the question: Are are the fish dying in the river? Um, and check we proved that um, both through um, this study with the Cyril did as well as subsequent studies with all of the other major stocks and both hatchery and wild fish um, in the Sacramento and San Joaquin basins. Then the next question becomes a little bit more complicated of sort of the when are they dying it's you know during low flow periods and warmer conditions where are they dying we were able to measure gross mortality by reaches between receiver gaps when fish would you know this would go offline and not move past a particular line of receivers that are at a point in the river. We found that survival in the upstream habitat was quite variable. The lower main stem habitat, where it was actually rather channelized, and it was survival was actually quite good, and presumably because there wasn't a lot of structure there for predators. Um, survival in our delta region was poor, as it was in our San Francisco Bay. The why of that um, leads into the next part of the study. We are able to, from these studies to correlate survival with flow and various environmental variables. But initially the Central Valley Research Consortium of, of research, the community, tried to then take acoustic tag technology to really move to the next step of addressing predator, um, using it to study predation rates and mortalities. And the reality is we found that Acoustic tag technology serves as a pretty poor tool when you want to get down into the nitty-gritty of proving predation is an actual cause of, of mortality. And as a result, the rest of this talk will sort of focus on the alternative methodologies and techniques we developed to focus on these more fine scale, which isn't to say that acoustic technology doesn't have value at that level. And there are advances in predator detection type tags so that if a juvenile fish is consumed by a 
a predator, it, the tag can change its ID code in some way. But there are still, when you're working worrying about something at a very near field regional area, a good deal of ambiguity depending on the mechanism by which that predator tag changes its ID code. If it's a digestion-based process, the fish could have, you know, and takes 12 hours, the fish could have moved quite far away. If it's an impact type analysis, then you might actually get a predation event at a particular point in space when it actually happened. So how do you study predation at its or other sources of mortality for that matter? We're focusing on predation for the interest parts of this talk, but really we had a sort of an interactive factor of water quality, water conditions, habitat alterations, as well as introduced predators in this particular California study. And so when you're thinking about that, it's good to just start thinking about it from a very simple, um, as simple an equation as you can think of. And, and where I kind of think about it is just mortality is really sort of a source of a type of mortality as well as the frequency by which that type of mortality occurs that obviously rapidly becomes more complicated, so you can have sources of mortality, which can include predators. In the case of California, we had extensive water diversions that um, where fish could literally get pumped out of the river and dumped into an agricultural field um, through a pipe. We had times when the water was simply too temperature for salmon, too high, water temperature was too high for salmon to possibly survive. And then there was also concerns of potentially pollution and some sort of contaminant runoff in the water quality. The frequency by which these events occur can also be directly or indirectly affected by flow, um, the fish's own growth rate, turbidity in the system, time of day, again temperature can be a source as well as a covariate, um, new invasions and changes in the ecosystem as well as physical habitat features and apparent competition with other prey species. So the while striped bass are a native species to the East Coast and an introduced species in California, when we first started looking at this question of bass predation in California, one of the questions that popped up was striped bass, as well as many of the East Coast and charcot species, largemouth and smallmouth and, and sunfish species, had been introduced 130 years ago, and salmon seemingly had coexisted for some time. Why were in salmon such dire straits now? If if bass were truly a, a new limiting factor, what had changed. One of the issues we came to realize is that the San Francisco Bay and Delta is one of the most highly invaded bodies of water on the entire planet. With the shipping and economic industry of California and San Francisco Bay, just the constant in-stream of ships from other points and coasts around the planet, there was regular introduce of introduction of ballast water species, um, inv um, of invasive species through ballast water. One of the key things was Asian, two species of Asian clams were introduced in the 70s and 80s. And they had a, a, a direct and indirect effect on predation where, one, their filtering activities in the water column actually served to clarify the water to a point where a visual predator like a bass might actually have a greater opportunity to prey upon a juvenile salmon. Um, it also had a competitive effect on striped bass, they think, where striped bass in an earlier life stage would spend more time as sort of a pelagic forager on plankton and were competing with these clams. And then, and when that competition rose to a certain level, striped bass actually altered their juvenile life history to start foraging in the littoral zones and become more pecivorous at a much earlier life stage. So a potential increase in predation rate on salmon there. Also, the introduction of aquatic plants sort of changed the structural characteristics, particularly for fish like largemouth and smallmouth bass, where they could take advantage of it. And by a change in structural characteristics, going to my next slide, both egeria and water hyacinth, what you're looking at here is an example of a river channel that is completely clogged with hyacinth that didn't used to exist. These used to be a free-flowing river channel that could be anywhere from it's roughly 10, 30 meters wide here, probably, or 20 meters wide here, and probably was, you know, two to five meters deep in various spots, and it's literally solidly clogged with hyacinth. So these dynamics sort of have a, a co-interaction to create problems. And then, of course, we were dealing with potential stakeholder conflicts where Bassmaster Magazine rated the California Delta number nine in the top 100 bass fisheries in the United States for sport bass fishing. And there was a, quite an economic industry developing around that. So that's a little bit of background. How do you go about studying predation? We have this kind of conceptual model of how all the various variables we need to think about might be interacting. And we sort of all work through the questions we use to address these. 
Our objectives in the study were first to manipulate predator densities to assess the influence of predator density on predation rates of salmon smolts in the system. And in general, we had some positive effects with this, and we had some negative effects or, or, um, in terms of the study. Um, first, we were able to actually sort of capture and capture predators in the river system and, and, and manipulate their true density in the system very briefly. However, we were dealing with some permitting constraints and optics about people being concerned about um, terminating these fish, even though they were introduced species. So we actually came up with a strategy of relocating them to other sections of the river. Um, but they often moved um, back very quickly. The other challenge with that was depending, it varied with species. So a striped bass is kind of a very roving predator. They actually, I'd like to think of them as having sort of a marine foraging strategy in a river linear environment, which is quite lethal for the species that are in their path. Whereas a, a large mouth bass or other um, Centrarchid species tend to be quite territorial and residential to one spot. And so if you remove them from that area, recruitment back to that area is probably takes longer. Um, the same individual, it turns out, relocated to another spot moves home quite quickly. But if removed and not allowed access to the river, then that's a different situation. Determining the movement behaviors of predators in the system, pre and post removal, I've already sort of touched on this point a little bit. Again, similar points. We used acoustic tagging of the fish we removed and relocated to other areas to track whether or not they returned to the reach they were captured in or whether they moved on to somewhere else. Um, quantifying the magnitude of predation on salmon smolts with genetic analysis of predator stomach contents. Several slides in the later portion of the talk will be dedicated to this, so I'm just going to move on. The other question we had was to assess the influence of water conditions on salmon predator avoidance capabilities. So the indirect effects of the habitat and the environment on the fish's susceptibility to predation was a really important question in this study. And we were quite successful in, in moving towards results on that. And then determining the abundance and local spatial distributions of predatory fish. We were able to do this quite well, but it was quite expensive. and. Um, um, and, uh, and I'll just touch on this briefly. The acoustic hardware and sophistication that we brought to bear on this was impressive, but not likely to be repeated under a lot of economic conditions that are outside the challenges of California. Um, and then finally, determining how predation on salmon smolts may be influenced by the physical habitat, the water comp chemistry, and all of the above, which is somewhat redundant with all the objectives above and is essentially the compilation of all of these results. So the predator issue, one of the things that I, questions I ran into when moving into the Central Valley in California and beginning to address this issue of predation of bass on salmon was there was a perception from classic stomach content analysis that salmon were a relatively rare prey item in striped bass and other bass stomach content. So therefore, they were probably, they were considered as not being a relative part of the salmon mortality problem. Unfor un what was, unfor was fortunate for our research was right as we were getting involved with it, a person named Eric Lobachevsky um, did a, as part of his PhD at UC Davis and then on to work with folks at California Department of Water Resources, did a bioenergetics model of the total number of pounds of fish the striped bass population in the California Central Valley needs to eat every year, um, and so which added up to roughly 25 million kilograms of fish per year was the biomass of juvenile fish that striped bass were consuming. It was also fortunate at that time that we were doing our own acoustic telemetry and survival studies with all of the local hatcheries in the, in the Central Valley. So we had both the, the sort of the mean size of all of the hatchery fish at release, as well as the total, the rough production, annual production numbers, which is fairly stable in the Central Valley. So doing just a rough back of the envelope calculation of that, you come up that the total biomass, and if you factor in the natural spawning production as well and round up by two, and then come up to get a very high conservative estimate, you, est you come up with an estimate that all of the juvenile salmon biomass in the entire California Central Valley adds up to roughly only 240,000 kilograms, which if bass were responsible for eating every single one of them, would still only meet just the striped bass species um, energetic requirements. So what you, this sort of says is that if you're seeing bass at, salmon at all in bass diet, then it's probably an indicator that they could be having a very significant impact on their 
mortality. Our study, dying, study design for this study was based on a premise of a, a removal experiment, and so we were asked by the management agencies to test sort of a very simplistic management question of, if we just get rid of all of the bass, will the salmon be okay? It was the fundamental question lying at everyone's in everyone's mind. And so we set up a replicated experimental design where we had a series of nine kilometer long reaches in the San Joaquin River. And the map that you see portrayed here on the screen is the river actually flows from south to north and moves up into the, the delta from that region. It's actually somewhat tidal in this region, so flow, flow can actually reverse in directions, but less relevant for the purposes of this study. In either case, we had three replicates of, of experimental types. We had three con control reaches marked in blue with C2, C1, 2, and 3. And these are reaches where we assessed the predator community that was present, but we did nothing to manipulate the density. We had three removal reaches colored in red, noted as R1, R2, and R3. And these were reaches that we removed predators from um, to reduce the density of predators in those areas. And as I mentioned, we were dealing with the sort of the permitting and political optics of, of what we would be doing with all of these fish. And, and there was a concern by the managers that they didn't want us to harm these fish in any way. And so we were at the same time concurrently worried that our removal might not have a very strong effect size. So we took advantage of what seemed like a, a challenge and turned it into an opportunity and chose to increase the density of predators in other areas by relocating to other reaches. So we had three augmented reaches where we increase the predator density to see if that could influence the, the increase the rate of mortality that we might see in these other things to effectively increase our signal to noise ratio in this study. So source of mortalities in this particular study. We used um, multi-pass electrofishing where we had three electrofishing boats running concurrently as well as two boats staffing them, um, basically running back and forth to um, collect the predators or any fish they caught, um, and so that there was a whole, essentially a flotilla of boats just processing tagging and either acoustically tagging or and or pit tagging, and either relocating or releasing depending on the experimental treatment of the reach we were in. And we would do as many as five passes in a particular reach per day. The general composition of everything we caught in terms of potential predators in these ecosystems was 45% of the fish caught across all the reaches were striped bass, 41% were largemouth bass, um, and then the next two largest contributors were white catfish and channel catfish, and then a, a bunch of smaller centrarchid species. I'm going to move into the um, genetic diet question. And when we first started doing the genetic diet analysis, we were a little bit concerned about what the value of it might be to us, because at least at current technology levels, the idea of running genetic analysis on the stomach contents of a fish, um, your results are simply a binary presence absence. So it might tell you a salmon was in a stomach, but it wouldn't tell you if there was one salmon in the stomach or 100 salmon in the stomach. However, we thought about this a little bit more deeply and figured that if you take a conservative assumption that if predation on salmon in general is quite rare, that if one, if your salmon are only being detected in a few percentages of the stomachs at any given time, the odds that there's multiple salmon in any one of those stomachs is pretty low. And so if you just start from a presence absence detection and use that as a conservative estimate that there was only one salmon in the stomach, it would give us a lower boundary of what minimum predation rates might be in a particular region. The results for that preliminary were in 2014, we saw actually 26% of the channel cats had were positive for having a salmon detected in their stomachs. In contrast, the largemouth bass, 3% of them had salmon in their stomachs. Striped bass had 6% of salmon in their stomachs. And white channel cats had, um, or sorry, white, white catfish um, had 3% of salmon in their stomachs. Slightly different results, but similar trends in 2015, with the biggest surprise being in both years that channel catfish was actually such a, a voracious salmon predator, which this and the catfish in general, we ran it more as a, a we weren't actually expecting a salmon signal in there, and we just ran it to be confident of 
everything else that's going in the ecosystem. And so it was a bit of a surprise result for us, but it was we were glad we did it. Um, it also raised the question as we moved into years where water quality was a real problem of are these catfish eating live salmon or is the river water quality conditions in the river deteriorated to the point where the juvenile salmon are just dying and settling to the bottom and are these catfish just forage, foraging on scavenging on dead fish and those are studies we've sort of pursued further but it'll probably be more detailed than I'll get into today so if you take the combination of the percentage of juvenile salmon detected in the striped bass stomachs and then combine that with our Marketing or our multi-pass electrofishing efforts where we were actually able to get, get an estimate of the number of bass in each one kilometer reach. We can then work, take the density of predators in a given region and up, combine that with the percentage of fish likely to have been eaten um, for both largemouth or striped bass as well as largemouth bass. Largemouth bass, we were able to generate population estimates in two different ways. We were able to do it through multi-pass electrofishing um, just like we did with striped bass for a given reach, but also the residency of the largemouth bass was so stable that it turned out we were able to do this through mark and recapture, tag and recovery of pit tag striped plat or largemouth bass from year to year. And, and it was very reassuring to see that the two different methods, um, the e-fishing depletion in pink and the pit tag mark and recapture methods in blue, gave very similar population estimates for each of the reaches with overlapping confidence intervals. Combine the population estimates for each of the removal reaches with the estimated frequency of salmon in their stomachs and you run with the uh, idea that a salmon is genetically detectable in the, the stomach content tissue of a predator for roughly two to three days with the based on the input we see from the genetics lab we were working with. We can then sort of extrapolate out to the per numbers of salmon eaten by the density of predators in a given reach um, over that sort of unit distance. And what you can see here is that for largemouth bass, we're seeing on the orders of 5 to 20 juvenile salmon being eaten per kilometer per two to three day unit is our extrapolation. And then similarly for striped bass, um, different numbers um, we're seeing, but with a, a broader range because the striped bass were sort of more variable in each of the reaches. The preliminary results that we're at for that, and this is a manuscript that is in review uh, with Cyril Michelle being the lead, that we were seeing roughly 2 to 16 salmon smolts being eaten by largemouth bass per kilometer per 2 to 3 day unit. And similarly, um, striped bass were 0 to 35 were being eaten per kilometer per 2 to 3, three day time unit. You can obviously then expand this out that um, for largemouth quite easily because they're homogeneously distributed over roughly 300 kilometers of habitat. And then striped bass, it's a little bit more complicated but because they're federally, fairly variable and, heter and or heterogeneous in their distribution over roughly 10 to 1,200 kilometers of, of habitat in the Central Valley. I didn't get into a lot of the other details of the genetic results, but one of the things we did found that, you know, if, if these bass are only eating 1% or salmon are making up only 1% of the diet, what are they eating? And it turns out, as characterized by the arrows here, they're eating a lot of each other, it turns out. We often found um, um, bass being predated upon, you know, each of the species was detected in each of the other species' stomachs, as well as several of the species, prey species of concern in the Central Valley, as well as many introduced um, forage fish species as well were really the primary components of the diet. So what does all this mean? It means, for one thing, we need to consider predators other than just striped bass. So we were obviously focused on bass, stripers as the sort of the predator of du jour of priority, but then it was interesting to find out that catfish may be playing a role. We also came to the conclusion that in re realistically in this predator prey food web, salmon smolts were actually a, a very small part of the food web, and then it was their, the food web was almost indifferent to them as a, as a part of it. Um, and then the predator species were actually probably responsible for keeping many of the other species that might be um, competitors with salmon actually in check, as well as each other in check by eating each other. Um, if we have time at the end, I can sort of work through an example where the serial generated where if you remove one 
a bunch of white catfish from the system, that might be good and it might save four salmon, but that white catfish might have gone on to eat 32 striped bass and 44 largemouth bass, et cetera, and how many salmon would they have otherwise eaten? So it becomes complicated. I'm going to skip on through these results and move on to other parts of the talk. And so revisiting what are our mortality causes, obviously we're focusing on the, the mechanistic cause of bass eating salmon, but what are the other ways of sort of confirming this and dealing with this? We were able to get predator abundance estimates in the reaches where we um, did the removal experiments, but it was very labor intensive in a very small area of just one kilometer. To really build this out over a much larger spatial scale, we worked with our hydroacoustic survey team at the Southwest Fishery Science Center in La Jolla, California, and they basically took the um, all the acoustic firepower that NOAA puts on one of its ocean-going research vessels and kind of doubled it and put it on the front end of a 19-foot boat and used a com combination of multi-beam as well as multi-frequency echo sounder technologies to then move up and down the predator channel, the river channels. And these are just sort of tidbits of the data you got where the echo sounder technology allowed us to produce phenomenally high resolution mapping of the habitat features, which is good because one of the covariates that we're interested in studying predation was the interaction of, of channel structure on predation susceptibility. So, you know, inshore shallow littoral habitat features versus deep scour holes and meanders in the river, where is predation more likely to happen? All of these can sort of, and then obviously overlay it is on this as sort of dots of acoustic targets. We're actually working on models to refine actually species ID of these various acoustic targets, but that's another two hour talk that we don't have time for today. Moving on to our, how we assess the effective density manipulations in the system. These are as, as sort of a blow up of the map and sort of a cartoon of how we actually would send juvenile acoustic salmon through with acoustic tags. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we didn't have a lot of faith that acoustic telemetry of salmon smolts was going to be a good indicator of predation. We suspected that that was just too coarse for this resolution, but we did it anyway. And the results were in fact very inconclusive. However, we did the removals as illustrated in the cartoon and manipulated the densities and then we sent acoustically tagged juvenile salmon through as well. Um, but the trying to affect um, survival of a acoustic tagged fish that doesn't have a predator detection unit at one kilometer resolution is pretty hard when predators themselves can keep moving and carrying the acoustic tag. Because of this, um, I should say this is again sort of a revisit of the densities of predators we found and just to show you how variable it was. And our removal reach at the southernmost interest was, was the area of highest management interest. The predator community was dominated by the striped bass, but the two northern reaches were actually dominated by largemouth bass and stripers had a smaller contribution. In total, we removed a combination of over 3,000 predators from these reaches in these these experimental reaches in the two years that we did this study. So the big sort of new method that we developed for testing these questions was the idea of essentially a, a baited drifting tether that went through the system and it allowed us to sort of integrate multiple environmental characteristics all at the same time. So both the effective movement um, along the water channel as a function of flow rates, which is a big question in California. Um, and so we had this multi-instrumented device with a live salmon hatchery smolt actually tethered to it. Sounds somewhat gruesome, but um, bear with me as you see the results of the science that came out of it. Um, from a mechanistic standpoint, I'm going to shift to a video here and our, our earlier test of the video showed that it was somewhat choppy, but I think my understanding is that it's still, you can get a general sense of, of this is the perspective from the GoPro camera that was on each one of these tethers that documented the video. So here you have the technician um, testing the juvenile salmon. We pit tagged each juvenile salmon to ensure that the ones we were introducing into the system weren't actually contributing to our predator st diet studies. Um, and then this is the camera's view of a juvenile salmon sort of swimming around um, below, underneath the tether. Here's some video of Asian carp that are just swimming around and obviously choosing not to forage upon the salmon, but sort of the first um, cut of seeing predation event. Now, there was a striped bass again and again taking a predator, a largemouth bass, a catfish, another bass, another striped bass, another striped bass, 
And even in some cases, you'd get the occasional centrarchid, a crappie in this case. It took several swallows to get that juvenile salmon down, but it, it did manage to make it happen. At the end, after the tether is drifted downstream for roughly an hour, it's recovered by the scientists and then deployed. And jumping back to our slides, what does this look like in terms of data? I should say, I'll start out and reiterate, our point in this component of the study was never to measure absolute predation rates, but study the variables that that influence, that variables that co-vary with the rate of predation. So we were never considering a salmon tied to a, a drifter as being a, representing true susceptibility, but we were able to study all these other variables that might vary as a function of, of that salmon being in the environment. To, as part of this, we at evening, we would typically send three boats out and deploy 10 of these drifters in each of the three experimental reach types on any given region on a, on a given night. And we would drift these for an hour at sunset, recover them, and deploy them again. And it was critical, we discovered, to do this across all the experimental reaches at the exact same, same time because the first, one of the first things we discovered that time of day had an overwhelming effect. So if you went to one reach and deployed it an hour before sunset, and then went to another reach and deployed it at sunset, you got a very different predation rate just as a function of time of day. Here's a beginning of what the data look like at just sort of a very coarse descriptor. What you have on the left is sort of the, the GPS tracks of these drifters as they move through the system, and then the red dots show the areas where predation events happened. On the right image is the exact same reach, but it shows the sort of the benthic habitat dense depth and structure um, in reds and blues, as well as blue dots, which are acoustic targets detecting large predator signals in the environment. And what you can see is that both predator distribution as well as predation events are non-random in the habitat, which is our first insight to a potential management solution here. So what are the covariates we were able to test by sending these drifters down the system? Well, there are quite a few. I won't read the entire list here, but you can see how we can look at the function of light intensity, time of day, turbidity, slope, bottom depth, distance from the edge, channel depth, et cetera, um, how all of these things might actually be looked at interactively through what was, we used a, a Cox proportional hazard model, which I'm gonna leave Cyril to sort of explain the mathematics behind that. Unfortunately, um, this was all developed, these analytical tools were developed by people that were far more intelligent than myself, um, but give you just sort of a schematic example of how this plays out. So you're able to take a section of river and using the high resolution multi-beam sonar have a very precise map of depth throughout the river channel. Overlaid on this we can do the contact points of um, where the various scour holes are in the region and quantify those. What we were able to do with the PERS is then just as the PERS had a, a light sensor and a temperature sensor that was sampling at a certain frequency, we were able to basically treat break by every five seconds in time, treat the PERS status, the drifter's status, um, as, as a unique data point um, as they're moving down through the river system until with the, at each point in time the question is being asked, was it predated upon or not? In the advanced five seconds, was it predated upon or not? Et cetera, et cetera. And this resulted in really the generation of hundreds of thousands of data points from what were thousands of deployments of these drifters. Overlaid on that is then you can see where the predation events happened. Um, so the purple dots are just all of the data points of where PERS drifted through this reach, and then the orange dots are the precise GPS locations um, where predation events actually happened. You can then sort of do this, take this data and assimilate it into a heat map of where the majority of the predation was really happening in terms of a metric of proportion of the PERS predated upon um, per unit time, and I had to practice saying that before I gave this talk to make sure I didn't stumble on my P's. And then you're able to sort of compare that with a heat map of predator densities in the system um, from the multi-beam sonar, and you get the, and I'm not trying to so much show the results that we got from the study here as the types of data you can get from the system, and just show that the overlay of correlating large-scale predation on a very large-scale spatial habitat. We're doing this in just a one-kilometer example here, but then you can take this and then extrapolate it to a much larger spatial scale of an entire river basin. And then you're also able to analyze the data in such a way of, the, you know, 
of any of these variables, whether it's depth or water velocity or time of day, and then develop a, a very specific sort of rate for each of these specific rate for to each region that we worked in, the probability of mortality happening um, in each of these control removal and addition reaches. The, I will sort of give away that we found that the, the experimental treatment effect of density um, manipulation actually had very little effect on the predation rate, um, but and it was actually sort of the, just a the large scale experiment of looking at predation under so many different environmental variables is where we gained the true insights in this study. And with that, we were able to basically develop the sort of relative influence of all of these variables, both positive and negative, on absolute predation rate across the habitats that we worked in for both depth, water velocity, time to sunset, light intensity, tide level, turbidity, temperature, and distance to shore, all were significantly related to predation rates that we observed in this study. So what does this mean for management? One of the things I was really sort of thinking about in the Central Valley is a lot of our management tools require basically constant annual investment. And these are the sorts of things where they're not, there's not fixing something once and then being done with it. And what falls under this obviously is like hatchery production. We, hatchery production is one of those things that we kind of expect that we're just going to have to keep paying for it every single year to make it happen. Um, as well as flow management in the Central Valley. Every year there's sort of a debate and battle of how much water can we send to Southern California and agriculture and how much water do we have to leave in the river for the fish. And that flow management is a constant um, issue. But one of the things we were sort of working towards was this idea of a stable state management solution. Folks were talking about the idea of predator population control, which was, you know, the initial hypothesis being tested in the study, but that really falls into that current management thing. We did find that you can manipulate the predator density in a particular reach, but the cost of that is so expensive and literally with there being hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bass in the system, the odds that you could really knock that down to any sort of level that just wouldn't rebound even more quickly than you knocked it down, um, we'll put it into one of those management tools that was going to require current investment. Whereas if we started through the methods here identifying strategic hotspots in the particular river where fish were far more susceptible to predation, it may be that we can actually manage the habitat feature at that location rather than actually trying to mess with the ecosystem in ways that we couldn't really forecast what the impacts would be. Because that was the other concern was the bass and catfish were eating each other as well as forage fish that were competing with salmon. And if we did a significant disruption to that food web, there were cascading effects on salmon that we just wouldn't be able to forecast for the managers. So we were really fo suggesting that they focus on habitat restoration as a way of mitigating um, predation problems in these particular systems. For further reading, several papers have come out of this work, um, and they're here, and we expect several more papers to come out of this work. And feel free to reach out to myself or Cyril Michelle um, for, for further results on all of these. And oh my god, I'm realizing I uh, didn't jump back into the slideshow version of this talk, but we finished, and I can, uh, um, here I'll jump back up to more for the acknowledgement slide. Um, these are uh, the, the many scientists and co-authors that contributed to this work um, from the fisheries research team included Steve Lindley, who is a supervisor for many of us, um, Joe Smith and David Huff and Cyril Michelle on the phone, as well as Tom Quinn from the University of Washington, um, the acoustics team, hydroacoustics team from NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center, David Deemer and Randy Cutter and Suzanne Manugian, as well as many of the field technicians who did go on to write many of the papers for this project included. Ely Alrek, Nick Demetrius, Brendan Lehman, Ben Burford, Tim Brown, Matt Miller, Megan Sable, and Vanessa Lowe, and, um, and many others as well came out to help on what was sort of an army of effort. And with that, I'll, I'll stop there and, and let Darla open the floor to, to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so as you mentioned, we'll now open the session for a question and answer period. So you have a couple of options for asking questions. You can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box that you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Um, if you're using the audio of your computer, you can figuratively raise your hand, which is the yellow icon, um, and we can unmute you to ask a question directly, or you also have the option of typing in your question, um, and we will read it aloud. <clears throat> 
and we're very fortunate today to be joined by Sean's colleague Cyril Michel who is able to respond to any of your questions in French. Donc si vous le préférez, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français. So both options are available. Um, so we have a couple of questions and comments coming in already. Um, so Pedro Nilo asks, any wild salmon present in system? Ha, huh, that, that is an excellent question. And, and there were some actually present in the system, although um, it, it was sort of in this particular study reach where we were working, um, they were even more rare than, than the hatchery fish in the system. But uh, there's a, a slide I didn't show from other talks where um, the Department of um, both U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, which is a state federal agency as well as the state fisheries or a federal agency as well as the state fisheries agency conduct regular trawl surveys along this section of the river to quantify presence of, of both hatchery and wild steelhead and juvenile Chinook, juvenile steelhead and Chinook salmon in this river. So yes, they were present. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, couple of comments come from Rick Simpson, who uh, makes the comment that that's a really neat data collection device that you've got there, the video that you showed. Um, he also comments that environmental flow needs assessment work is being done uh, in the Okanagan right now for its major tributaries. The lead is ONA-FD biologist Eleanor McGrath, if that's any help. Okay. Is it, I'm sorry, did I miss the question? Uh, so he was just providing some comments. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Samuel Andrews asks, uh, how does acoustic tagging of smolt affect vulnerability to predation? Uh, that is decreased swim uh, maximum speed, stress, change in behavior. Could this result in an artificially high estimate of predation impact? Did you test whether acoustically tagged fish were more susceptible to being eaten than untagged fish? So the, it's an excellent question and one that gets asked all the time. Um, in the large scale acoustic studies that Cyril Michel did on the, the basin scale acoustic tagging studies, we did do that. In every single um, tagging study that we do, um, fish are are held to um, in captivity while the primary cohort of fish are, are released to swim downstream, and so they're they're held in captivity to ensure that there aren't any sort of secondary infection or direct mortality causes from the surgery itself. And the initial the obvious result the standard result from there is we have almost um, you know, high 90 to 100% survival of all the acoustically tagged fish that are held in captivity. Now, obviously, those fish aren't experiencing the same pressures that they are in the wild environment, and so that there may be a difference in susceptibility. Um, Cyril, you may want to weigh in on this. Did we do any sort of flume testing on that with the fish Brendan did, or was that just simply the um, untagged fish? Uh, we've we've done some flume testing uh, in the past, um, but none of that was ever published. Um, but what I will what I will mention is uh, for for a lot of the studies that we've done in the past, where we're trying to estimate survival through different parts of the river, we're we're, we're certainly very careful about making sure that we tag fish in the best condition possible and test them for any tag effects further down the road. Um, but for this particular study here. We weren't so interested in the actual survival uh, estimates, but more the relative changes in the different control, addition, and treatment sites. Um, so, uh, I, you know, the, the concern about a tagged fish not behaving quite the same as an untagged fish is definitely always on our minds. But I think, given this study design, uh, it's, it's kind of robust against that. In that, uh, we're still just looking for relative changes. And uh, and uh, Sean didn't really go into too much detail on that, but. Uh, what we saw was uh, was very little uh, changes in relative survival between uh, the different treatment sites, and and we think in large part that's because the uh, the effects of the removals and the addition uh, were actually uh, kind of small when compared to the the dynamic changing environment, and and it's kind of a, a testament to the fact that um, you really have to make a pretty huge effort to have a large enough impact on predator populations to be able to even detect it using acoustic tagging technology. Thank you to you both. Um, we have a request from Anthony Fritz who wants to know if we could go back to the literature cited slide. <laughs> 
I'm let's see, I'm sure we can. Let me see if I can make that happen. There we go. Great, thank you. Um, a question I should, from I should mention. Oh, oh sorry, this is Sarah. Oh, I should please. mention there there should be at least two or three more papers coming coming out in the next couple of years, or at least next year. So this this list should continue with with most of the lead authors being myself and Joseph Smith. Thank you. Um, we have another question from uh, Sarah Zenoweski, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, do you think it would be possible to manage predators in lake systems that are in line with streams by removal, or do you still feel that managing the habitat features are the best method? That's a, a really good question. I guess it would depend on the lake system and and if it has if predators and there's the sort of whether the lake has alter other sources of predators the I wasn't sure from the question whether they had rivers connected to them or not the predators may move in and out of I would think a smaller lake system you probably could actually manage something that, like that in fact I know that the US Fish and Wildlife Service in in Yellowstone um, National Park in in Wyoming, Montana, Yellowstone Lake is a, a massive um, volcanic caldera lake that's, you know, I think it's more than 50 kilometers long and, and hundreds of meters deep in sections. And lake trout were introduced in there roughly 20 years ago, and their populations exploded and were on the verge of decimating the, the native planktivorous cutthroat trout populations. And they were able to basically discover the lake trout spawning beds and through a very aggressive but never ending um, gill net culling method, they basically just set gill nets on the lake trout spawning beds for weeks at a time and just to can and and they're able to sort of preserve and and maintain the lake trout population at a small level. Um, but and and that's a very large lake system. So it's theoretically possible but expensive. She does add a follow-up comment that, yes, the rivers, streams that are uh, connected upstream and downstream of the lakes with invasive species, not kettle lakes or closed systems. So there, I guess it would you'd want to try and identify the when and where that predation happens. From a lot of our acoustic tagging studies and predation studies, we found that, you know, I, I probably tend to always over-exaggerate this, but it that my sort of gestalt was 80% of the protasion happens in 20% of the habitat. And and in some cases, we had a, another graduate student, Megan Sable, um, who her master's thesis was on a, a water diversion where striped bass literally were just decimating the salmon as they were coming over this little agricultural flow diversion dam. And, and you know, just having like an 80% impact or something like that right at the base of the dam in literally a five meter area. And then there wasn't any evidence of salmon predation for the next several kilometers downstream. So if you can identify a particular habitat feature like that, again, it comes to the, it may be possible to manage a specific feature, whether it's a dock or, or whatnot, to just decrease the susceptibility of salmon to predation or whatever your species of preservation of concern. Thank you. Um, we have a request from Robert Vadis Jr. Uh, asking, would you show the slide again for uh, positive versus negative effects of environmental variables on salmon predation rates? It was a lot to digest. Sure. Is this the correct one? Um, I think so, but we'll, we'll wait to see if he comments if he asks for a different one. <laughs> Um, a follow-up question from Pedro Nilo, uh, could hatchery fish be more um, naive, susceptible to predators? So we expect that that is absolutely the case, that hatchery fish are my, more naive and susceptible. Um, but the, you, know, on a, you have to sort of think on that, that naivete on a per unit time. A hatchery fish often only needs one to two weeks to sort of survive and get out of a river. Whereas a wild fish often has to spend one to two years, in the case of Atlantic salmon, you know, two years in, in a system. So while on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the odds of a wild fish surviving against a hatchery fish may be, you know, two, maybe even five times greater um, cumulated across, you know, two years, that predation is still likely to eventually capture that wild fish if, 
Thank you. Uh, Samuel Andrews has uh, another question. Um, predation is a function of availability and accessibility of prey items. Did you measure the abundance of alternative prey species in the river compared to smolt and how those changes may have affected the number of smolt that were predated? Was there an alternative preferred prey item whose abundance could be increased to mitigate impacts to smolt? So Cyril, you can weigh in on this. I'll take a crack at it first. We didn't formally measure the abundance of all the forage items. But what I will say is there were just simply too many other fish in the, in the system um, to, to physically capture them. We were hoping to get some estimate of that from the hydroacoustic surveys eventually. But the reality was is in a day where we caught 40 different species of fish in, 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 a, in an intensive removal event, only two of those species, two, maybe three of those species were actually native to this particular ecosystem. Again, going back to my point of being highly invaded. So the system is so overly, overwhelmingly invaded and dominated by non-native species that all the native species combined account for less than 1% of the existing biomass now. So I doubt any sort of increase in other species would cause to create any sort of prey buffer um, for those particular species. That may or may not be the case. I know that's sort of a concept in Atlantic salmon of recovering like river herring populations to, as a prey buffer so that there's just fewer fewer things to target or fewer salmon targets by having more river herring people. It's, they're just much easier to capture. So that could be what the qu person's question was getting at. Thank you. Uh, Sam will ask you to, if you have any other further questions to follow up to that, just please enter them in. Um, one question um, I'm wondering, um, did you look at all that temporal variation, like through seasonal variation of predation through time, where we've been particularly interested in, um, say, pre, during spawning period and post spawning? Um, is that something that you looked at at all? So this particular study was really focused on the time window around salmon smolt out migration in the lower river section. So that's a, a rather small period of time during the year. Um, but we've done acoustic tagging studies of all the different run types in the Sacramento Basin, which all run at different times of year. So we have estimates of mortality for the different stocks as they migrate downstream at different times of the year, whether it's January and December or October or March, April or May. Um, and, and this study could be repeated in those other reaches on those other stocks. But for this particular study, our temporal range was really a, only a five to six week period. Great, thank you. Um, and so I think that is the end of our questions. Thank you so much, Sean. This was an excellent presentation. And thank you so much, Cyril, for, for participating as well and helping to answer questions. Um, a reminder to all of the participants that the next webinar in the series will be on November 1st. Uh, Matt Chihua of INRS will be speaking about fluvial remote sensing and spatial analysis of Atlantic salmon habitat quality for management. The presentation itself will be in English, and the registration link is available on our website. A quick reminder that the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation is now accepting funding applications, and the final deadline for submission of new proposals is November 15th. So thank you again to Sean and to Cyril, and thank you to everyone for participating. We'll hope you'll all join us again very soon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.